lesson 27, we finish reading the Hatha Yoga Pratipika. We are in chapter 1, Sutra 50. Then the Shimasana is described. Place the ankles below the scrotum on either side of the perineum, the right ankle on the left side of it, and the left ankle on the right side. 51. Place the palms upon the knees, spread out the fingers, and with open mouth look at the tip of the nose with concentrated mind. Yes! <laughs> Show us! <laughs> This is so much fun when you do this with children. <laughs> when you do this literally, you end up like this. <laughs> but of course, if you have paid attention in the previous lessons, you probably already a bit suspicious, expecting that there is more to it. And there is. The open mouth is referring to Ashna Chakra, the cosmic mouth. Remember that the essence of yoga is not the physical body. The essence of yoga is energy. And the cosmic mouth, that is the entrance of Shiva energy. So there are many different words to refer to that. The cosmic mouth, open mouth, Ashna Chakra, uh, Chandra Bindu, and what have you. And you also noticed also here, Satmarama, he deliberately uses different concepts or different words to refer to the same concept. Because he wants you to learn yoga under the guidance of a teacher, not from a book. So to create confusion, he plants booby traps and he also uses different words for the same concept to confuse you. He wants you to find guidance from, he called, there are many terms also he even uses for that. It has to be learned under the guidance of a guru, of a teacher, of a shiga, of what are so many different kinds of words that he uses for that. But he repeats that time and time again with, with, with introduction of a new technique. He emphasizes that you must learn this under guidance. And all those words, guru, teacher, what have you, that's all superficial. You need to learn yoga from somebody who is initiated. Whatever title is not important. Now, Shimasana, again, I've had classes with, ki with kids, it's big fun. You have to play, you have to fool around. You should not tell them to be quiet and to close their eyes and meditate, because they, they are kids, they're children. Use their imagination, do a tree pose and tell them that the wind is blowing and, uh, and those kind of things. Um, there are many ways to engage them. It's very exhausting <laughs> for a teacher. But it's big fun, it's really big fun. And the Shimasana, the, the lion pose, of course, uh, is excellent. If you cross your eyes, they're all getting belly aches from laughing because the teacher is uh, looking funny. But what you're really doing, like the previous two exercises, remember that these are the quintessential exercises of Shiva. There are 84. Svatmarama introduces us four of those 84. Last week we had Padmasana and we had Siddhasana. Now, Shimasana is considered to be one of those very special exercises, and that's what it is. You cross your ankles, you put your hands on your knees with your fingers touching the ground. Then you make a hollow back, very deliberately. So you stick out your tailbone, you push your belly down, and you close your eyes. Don't cross your eyes, don't open your mouth, don't stick out your tongue, but concentrate on what you feel. You have to actively engage with the hollow back. 
what you notice then is as if some some breeze is blowing at your tailbone if you pay attention you feel some in Korean you would say shiwanamukim at your tailbone which is the realization of Surya Bindu and as the text also indicates Shimasana leads to the realization, which means you becoming aware of the three bandhas. So this is an energy exercise. The fact that it's a bit complicated because of the balancing act and the need to actively engage the upper body with the, with the hollow back tilting the pelvis that is to increase that sensitivity towards the three bandhas. And that the easiest to realize is here, at the tailbone. Fifty-three. This is Simhasana, this is held in great esteemed by the highest yogins. This most excellent asana facilitates the three bandhas. There you have it. So to emphasize the specialness of the pose, he does that by claiming it is in helping great esteem by the highest of yogins. <clears throat> 53 next the badrasana is described place the ankles below the place the ankles in the groin you, you can see here yeah, that the text was written from the point of view of man practicing yoga so we can easily adapt those texts to um, to women or uni unisex the next, the Badrasana is described. Place, place the ankles below the, in the groin on the sides of the perineum, the left ankle on the left and the right ankle on the right, sole to sole. 54. Then firmly hold the feet with the hands which are on their sides and remain motionless. This is Badrasana, which destroys all diseases. The yogins who have become Siddhas call this Gorakshasana. Gorakshasana is one of the one of the great yogis at the very beginning of the lineage of yoga starting with Siddhasana. Such a legendary yogi. Again, to emphasize how special this exercise is, he equates it with some very special legendary yogi. <coughs> Remain motionless indicates this is a concentration meditation exercise like Shimasana, Padmasana and Siddhasana are meditation exercises. I forgot to mention that with Shimasana but the last sentence in Sutra 51 says look at the tip of the nose with concentrated mind. Meditation exercise. So we go back to Badrasana 55. Thus, the best of yogins, being free of fatigue in practicing asanas and bandhas, should practice purification of the nadis, the mudras, etc., and control of energy. Let's first have a look at Badrasana. You put your foot soles together and holding your feet with your hands. You pull the heels back as far as possible. Of course, it's important that you don't sit like this. You have to actively erect, like we do in every pose. When we are standing on our feet, sitting, lying down, or even upside down, we always try to erect. This in itself is Padrasana. Of course, 
you can bend forward, which is what most, not only even in yoga, but also as a warm up in the gym, people often do this stretch. They don't stay sitting like this, but we, we then we bend forward. I sit like this about 10 minutes a day in Padrasana. It's the last exercise of my routine. The muscles that are involved in Padrasana are the biggest muscles in your body and very difficult to tame them, so to speak. So if you are stiff there, just, this is not very yogic, but practical, it's very powerful method to get used to Padrasana and to loosen up those muscles, not only in the thighs, but in the hip. Sit against the wall, perfectly straight. Oops, there is a hatch. <laughs> Dragon will come out. Sit straight and, uh, you know, um, watch the news or have your morning coffee or do something that helps you to make time pass. It is time that does the work here. If you do this on a regular basis, you will see that very naturally, without pain, without torture, your knees will slow, but slowly but certainly come down. So as I said, it's not very yogic, watching the news or, or reading news on your smartphone or having tea or coffee while doing this, but it is a very practical way to, to condition those huge muscles. And it will benefit you in many other exercises as well. And there's another exercise, it's not in the book, but that's Upanista Konasana. Padrasana we will do at the end of this course. Upanista Konasana eventually will be part of the advanced course. You spread your feet as wide as possible and then you bend forward also. Do not try to hold your toes as you see many yogi books do. Stretch forward because that helps you to elongate your spine. When you try to grab your feet, you're going to hunch your back. In this way, stretching forward, you elongate your spine. So these kind of exercises, actually this applies to all exercises, but it's involving big muscles in the body. Don't push, don't force, just let time do its work. And in, in a practical sense, it's helpful if you if you make time pass by doing something to distract you. It's, I say again, it's very unyogi, but it's very helpful. Yes. Because you show that like the old. Then you lie against the wall. Okay. With your buttocks tight, and you spread your feet. In the beginning, it's uncomfortable, so just, you can't drink tea in this way, but you can, um, you can just close your eyes. <laughs> or read, your smartphone has everything. Then it becomes comfortable at some point, then you bring your, knee, your heels down a little bit. But this takes time, five, 10 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. If you do this regularly, you will, you will within a couple of weeks, you will see great progress. But you have to persist. Probably a Goraksh. I don't know actually. Is there a Goraksh asana? I think she called this Goraksh 
Right. Um, there was with the wasn't it with Patmasana that there were four different ways to call it? Muktasana, Kuptasana. There are many ways to, there are many exercises. I, the first, the very first book that I read about yogas made the statement that there are eight million asanas. That sounds very incredible, <laughs> mind boggling. Eight million. Yeah, but everything becomes asana if you approach it in a meditative way. So eight million. I think if you count, you will not reach that number, but that is not the point. There are just innumerous, innumerable, innumerous, uncountable, possibly. But if you read the book, the, the yogas, the, 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 the yoga dipika of um, um, the one that we are using, Iyengar, has exactly 200 exercises which is a lot. I have a book at home from an Indian yogi, uh, um, um, First Steps to Yoga. Uh, it has 300 exercises, 100 more than Iyengar's book. A very complicated, very complicated presupposes uh, much more than Iyengar. Um, compared to 8 million, what is 200, 300? But, but, so you ask yourself, how did they come up with the number 800 or 8 million? Everything, if you approach it in a meditative way, can be considered asana. And what you see with uh, important asanas is that there are various ways to address them. And the, the reason why they did that is to emphasize not only their quality, but their importance also. Um, yeah. Say, it, say again. Is it that like if we do just only one pose of asana yeah. in the correct way, yeah. then that would be enough. So in the, in the in our advanced course, in the third module, you do only one asana, but you stay fifteen minutes in the pose, or you do two or three asanas, and you stay three, four, five minutes in the pose. In the end. The longer you stay in a pose, the deeper the effect. But we have yamas and niyamas. You have in 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 Jeju, though, you have a famous hatha yogi. What's her name again? Iori. <laughs> Iori. Everybody's laughing. If you go to Iori as a total beginner, she will tell you, for example, to do a. a Bhujan uh, Asana, uh, the lion pose, the snake pose, 12 minutes. That is pure violence, torture. Not only physical, but for a total beginner who knows nothing about silence, meditation, and what have you, concentration. That's inhuman. But they think that is Hatha Yoga. In the end, it is correct provided that you have many years of reconditioning your body to enable you to stay for a longer period of time in a pose. So, you know, because of our very systematic approach, I always write down on the right side a time indication in seconds, but time is not important. What is really important, how long do you stay in asana? Who knows the answer to that? How long do you stay in asana? How do you determine how long you stay in asana? When, when it starts to get uncomfortable. Yes. Based on feeling. You have to follow your feeling. You will understand that when you understand the purpose of, what is the purpose of asana? Is to create 
Sattva. The moment that an asana becomes painful, uncomfortable, you overshoot the goal. You're building, a, you're building sattva by doing asana, but then the moment comes that it becomes uncomfortable, sattva is destroyed. But the normal human being doesn't look at those elements. The normal human being looks at the clock and says, oh no, I have to stay longer. And so we grind our teeth and we say, no pain, no gain, I have to stay longer. And we think that that is good. Maybe when you go to the gym, lifting weight or, or, or uh, uh, crossfit, or it can have a purpose because there it is purely physical. But if you approach yoga in that way, you're not going anywhere. Because the whole purpose of yoga is sattva. And all the wonderful benefits that come from sattva. Not physical prowess, not physical strength, which is a byproduct, a side effect. So follow your feeling. If you're too comfortable in a pose, try to adjust a little bit. Because many yoga teachers will say, Relax in the pose. Wrong. You never relax in the pose because the moment you relax, you also destroy sattva because you become tamas. It may be nice and comfortable, but that's not what yoga is about. We have tapas to deal with that. Tapas, the definition of tapas is consciously subjecting yourself to discomfort in order to generate strength which equals energy which equals our most precious asset all your developments are based on energy you have to create generate that precious energy and that energy has to be of a particular quality sattva So when you are doing an asana, it's too comfortable, you try to adjust a little bit. Try to screw up the intensity a little bit with some small adjustments until it feels like, yes, this is working. You feel a certain intensity. But you have to know also when to stop pushing. Because when you continue to push and it becomes painful, if you pay attention, and that's why it's best to close your eyes when you practice alone. Close your eyes when you're in asana. You're much deeper feeling what, you, what you're actually doing. When you keep pushing beyond the comfort zone, you become mentally restless, disturbed. And that is when you know that you've gone too far. So that happens, one, when you push too hard, and two, when you stay too long. And there are poses, Padangustasana, for example, after a little bit of reconditioning by doing it regularly, you can stay in Padangustasana easily for two minutes, more than a minute, without too much effort, without easily coming to that point where it becomes so uncomfortable that you destroy your sattva. Even a beginner can do that. But Mayurasana is a pose you will never be able to stay more than a minute. Mayurasana, the peacock pose, even after 30 years of practice you will not be able to stay more than a minute. But there are other poses that can very easily, after years of practice, easy to stay. Three minutes, four minutes. And that is when asana truly becomes meditative. And the longer you stay, if you follow the guidelines, the yamas and the niyamas, the deeper the effect, naturally, obviously. But follow your feeling, always follow your feeling. Don't look at the clock. 
My studio in Itaewon didn't have a clock. Other than my biological clock. No mirrors, no clock. <laughs> you have to turn your attention inwards. Then with Sutra 55, you see that Svatmarama concludes Asana and prepares you for the next step, which is clearly energy control. Thus, the best of the yogins being free of fatigue, meaning that you have reconditioned yourself, free of fatigue in practicing asanas and bandhas, should practice purification of the nadis, mudras, etc., and control of energy. So he is leading us towards pranayama, mudra, and concentration, meditation, contemplation. 56 Sutra, asanas, the varieties of kumbhaka, the positions called mudra, then concentration upon nada, the inner sound, comprise the sequence of practice in hatha yoga. So here we kill another misconception about hatha yoga. Many people think that hatha yoga is only asana practice. It's not. Hatha yoga is the eightfolded path minus the philosophical part of Raja Yoga, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. But Hatha Yoga is all eight limbs of the eightfolded path, including Pranayama, Mudra, and the three levels of meditation. 57. The Brahmachari, one devoted to Brahma, who leads a chaste life, who, following a moderate diet, is intent on yoga, renouncing the fruit of his actions, becomes a Siddha after a year. There need be no doubt about this. A Brahmachari devoted to Brahma, that if you understand the word Brahma, then it makes it sound like a religion, because Brahma is God. But in a practical sense, what this really means is somebody who is dedicated to practice yoga, somebody who takes yoga practice serious. That means that you have a certain discipline, that you are dedicated, devoted even to your practice. The sutra is basically saying, if you practice regularly, you will have great results from your practice. Within one year, you will reach the level of Siddha. What is Siddha? That is the development where your crown chakra is functioning. One year is not so long. And it is very realistic. I dare say, the moment that I started practicing yoga, those developments started taking place immediately. From the very first day that I started practicing yoga, it started changing my, my life completely. That is why I fell in love with yoga and became addicted to it. But it is also the reason why I am so adamant about presenting yoga properly. If you want to learn other forms of yoga, that's fine. But because I have experienced how incredibly powerful yoga is when done in accordance with the ancient tradition, I can't teach any other way than I do. I've tried Ashtanga Yoga. We had an Ashtanga Yoga teacher, very fanatic, very high level. And I wanted to learn from him to diversify. So in his free time in between classes, he practiced on his own. He was so fanatic. I asked him if I could join him. And I tried twice and I, I was done. 
it just feels so not yoga. And it's wonderful, and the skills, the, the strength, the flexibility, amazing. But when you're used to sattva, <laughs> that's not it. It's very rajas. Also, very interesting, I usually say that you should ignore text between square brackets, but here, that you should renounce the fruit of your actions. This is very interesting, because it is very difficult. Human beings are result-oriented. We want to see results from what we do. Not tomorrow, yesterday. We have no patience. If you really devote yourself to something, not, you know, yoga, you can replace yoga with any word. Life. Or your job. Or your study. The best results are gained if you have the intent and the passion to do what you're about to do. Whatever it is, if you're interested in architecture, bury yourself in books and studies of architecture, not with the goal to become an architect or to become rich through that profession, but just because you are interested in architecture. The profession and the wealth will come very naturally as a result. Ironically, if you study architecture with the ulterior motive of status, and wealth, it won't come to you. And you will not enjoy your job. But if you are passionate about architecture and you just study architecture for the architecture, you become a specialist by default. And very naturally you will find your way on the path of becoming an architect and very naturally you will start to make an income. Out of it. Renouncing the fruits of your labor means focus on something that you really love to engage in and try to not be absorbed by the possible fruits. Yes, you can keep them in the back of your mind that possibly you could, somewhere down the road, you could make a living out of it. But try, with yoga also, try to practice yoga for the yoga. Not for possible status or the money that you could possibly make as a yoga teacher. There are thousands of mediocre yoga teachers that don't do yoga because they're passionate about yoga. It's just a way to make a living. Because of that, the situation is very diluted. There are too many yoga teachers in Korea, for example. Too many. It's a very low paid job as a result of that. And many people do not have the right motive to be a yoga teacher. It's just, you know, before yoga, it was a uh, taekwondo or ballet or belly dance. When belly dance became popular, everybody became a belly dance teacher. And then Pilates became popular and all those teachers switched to become a, a Pilates teacher, belly dance teacher. And then yoga became popular and they switched to a yoga teacher. The very superficial, very mechanical. Renouncing the fruit, that is a very difficult way of living life. Can you see that? It means you have to sacrifice. You have to surrender. Can you do that? Yes, you can. But it's not easy. And it's trial and error. Because we are human. I've also functioned like that. Trying to surrender, trying to do what I love, but at the same time being very concerned 
with the results, with the outcome. It leads to conflict, it leads to unhappiness, it leads to... But you grow and you develop, and at some point you say... <laughs> and then everything starts to flow, everything starts to go smooth. I see some of you really recognize that. It's not easy. Nothing in yoga is easy. But it's, it's marvelous, it's wonderful. Everything starts making sense. But as human, we are only human, we have our instincts, our lower emotions and desires. You cannot just wish them away, you have to confront them. You have to, you have to become familiar with how they, how they affect you. It's a process, two steps forward, one step back, I always say. Two steps forward, one step back. One step back is the setback, the suffering, the failure. We try to avoid setbacks in life, failures, mistakes. But without this one step back, you can never make two steps forward. It's part of the process. I hope we all will come to the point that we start to appreciate failure, mistakes, suffering. Because they are what leads to the next two steps forward. We live in a world where we look at, at failure and mistakes in a very negative way because we do not appreciate, we do not see the cause and effect in play here. A failure is very important in life to grow. The next time when struck by failure, by misery, just try to understand what is happening and why it is happening and what led to it and you always come back to yourself and you learn something new about about yourself that you didn't know yet that is where self-realization comes truly in practice Fifty-eight. Moderate diet is defined to mean agreeable and sweet food, leaving one fourth of the stomach free, eaten as an offering to please Shiva. So again, it is made like a, it is made like a religion where you make a, you make a, an altar, where you put food, and a candle and a statue of God Shiva. Yes, <laughs> that is kind of what you make out of this sutra. No, this is not about, this is not about worshipping statues and sacrificing food <coughs> to please Shiva. You must not overeat. Shiva is energy, your condition, your divine condition of the crown chakra being open. Everybody knows what happens when you overeat, you collapse, you feel tired. But energetically what happens is your energy crashes. You worked so hard to get your energy to rise, to open the crown chakra. And then you do something stupid and you crash. Just play with it. I like food very much. I think if I had not discovered yoga in my life, I would be a chef now. And probably three times as big. I love food. But I, I control what I eat very well. Because if I eat too much, I crash. If I eat too much superficial food, I crash. So I'm very austere, but I very, I'm, I'm a gourmand, I like delicious food. Talking about it makes me water in my mouth. <laughs> but try to just be aware of that. The Sutra basically says, eat just enough, but not until the point that you're full.
leaving one fourth of the stomach empty means don't eat until the point that you feel full. You eat enough to feed yourself, but not until you you collapse, <laughs> you crash. The highest levels of cuisine. Have you ever eaten in a very exquisite, expensive restaurant? And you thought, when we're done here, I will go to McDonald's. <laughs> why? Because the portions in that restaurant are so small. And you think, why don't they serve more? Here you have the answer. Don't go to McDonald's after such a wonderful experience. 59. The following things are said to be not salutary for yogins. Things that are bitter, sour, pungent, salty, heating, green vegetables other than those ordained, sour gruel, sesame or mustard oil, sesame, mustard, alcohol, fish, flesh, including that of the goat, curds, buttermilk, horse gram, the fruit of the jujube, oil cakes, asafoetida and garlic. <coughs> What is this all about? These are all foods that are disturbing your sattva. Have you, have you been to a, if you go to a temple in Korea, Buddhist temple, usually you can join a, a lunch, for lunch. Sometimes it's free, sometimes they ask a small donation. Have you tried Buddhist food? It's very boring. If you're a little bit, uh, a joker, you said it's only grass. <laughs> of course, there's no meat in the Buddhist uh, menu, but it's also rather bland. And yet, if the chef does their work, they make it very tasty. But it's lacking anything that is that is outstanding spices, spices that are strong, pungent, sour, salty, etc. Everything that is mentioned here, basically. Why? The Buddhists in the temple, their goal is the same as ours, sattva. So those foods are either young foods, most of the times they are young foods, so they, they, they uh, uh, lead to a rajas condition, restlessness, or they are yin foods. They, they, foods that are heavy are yin foods, fried foods, heavy foods are yin foods, they, they make you tamas. Now interestingly, you should not eat green vegetables. Strange. Because we live in a world where people think that salads are very healthy. There are people who eat only salads as a meal. Why should you not eat green leaves? Because green leaves, they Indeed, they contain very healthy nutrients, but they are incomplete. For that, you have to understand how a plant functions. A plant that grows carrots or potatoes or rice or apples has leaves. Those leaves function is to, to transform the energy from the sun into nutrients for the plant to grow. The real nutritious part of the plant, that is the seed or the fruit. You will see in the next sutra or the sutra that follows after. So green vegetables are very healthy, but should be only a small part of your meal for the fiber, for the vitamins, certain minerals. But the most important parts are found in other, not in the leaves. 
Sixtieth Sutta, diets of the following nature should be avoided as unhealthy, food that having been once cooked has grown cold and is heated again, food that is dry, devoid of fat, or has an excess of salt or sourness that is bad or has too much of vegetables mixed with it. Vegetables mentioned again here. Food that having been once cooked, cooled down and then heated again should be avoided. <coughs> when this was written, people didn't have fridges. <laughs> I never throw away food. If you take this literally, you would, you would cook a meal, eat until you have enough and throw away the rest. I tell you not to do that. That shows a total disrespect of the whole process of people and nature to create that valuable food for us. We have fridges, we can put our food in the fridge. So this is, this part of the sutra, I, personally I, I do not throw away food. I never throw food until it's really <laughs> not good anymore. Until it starts developing legs and walks out of my fridge, <laughs> so to speak. But food that is dry, that is interesting. This sutra is telling us to eat fats. We, well, I think we are over the time that the supermarkets were full of light products and 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 uh, you know all the all the products were actually they did a lot of work to extract all the fats from it because we thought that was healthy. And then twenty years later, having done so much effort to eat dry food, scientists come to the conclusion that. Fats are actually very healthy and even essential for the proper functioning of the glands, of the brain, of so many important organs in our body. They knew that already thousand years ago. So stop with dieting and, and, and the, the light craze and, and what have you. Just enjoy your food and don't take too much of it. Sixty-one. In the beginning, fire, here you see again it's written from the perspective of men practicing yoga. You can replace women by men or partners, sex. In the beginning, fire, sex, journeys should be avoided. For thus, Koraksha says, association with bad company, fire, women, men, and long journeys Bathing early in the morning, fasting, etc., and hard physical activity should be avoided. In the beginning. That is the opening of the sutra. This does not only apply to yoga. If you have a new job, if you move house, and you start a new life in another city, in another place, your body, your body uses much more calories than when you're in a stable condition, in a stable routine. So when you start practicing yoga, the sutra says, you have to consider that you need to eat extra. You need to eat extra, extra nutritious foods. Avoid distraction with socializing. Meeting friends, of course, is good to socialize, but if you're serious about your yoga practice, you will very quickly come to the conclusion that it is becoming a distraction. Sex. Sex is healthy, but you want to focus on your endeavor, your new endeavor on the path of spirituality. Sex produces lots of very healthy hormones like pheromones and, and serotoninus and what have you, endorphinus, the, the stuff that makes you feel good and happy, but it consumes a lot of energy too, which at least in the beginning you should dedicate yourself to your newly chosen endeavor. And again, this is not only applying to yoga, it applies to everything in life. If there is change, some 
new engagement, just focus on that for a while. Until things settle down, you can engage in being normal again. So here, fire is mentioned, but in later centuries, after the text was written originally, somebody added near the fire, basking near the fire during winter. Well, we talked about the, the floor heating, and that can indeed be uh, devastating for uh, Manipura Chakra. But this is, of course, about ambition. The fire center, Manipura Chakra, is the location of ego and ambition. So, if you are full of ambition on things related not to yoga, you will never succeed in your yoga practice. You, at least in the beginning, you should focus, lay the foundation, and try to not be distracted by other endeavors. It means focus on one thing at a time. Yeah? The fire here should not be taken literally, although you can with a twist. Long journeys, bathing early in the morning, fasting, anything that takes a lot of effort and consumes a lot of energy, uh, better temporarily be avoided so you can focus on your yoga practice. 62. The following things are suitable to be taken by the yogin. Pay attention here, this is interesting. Wheat, rice, barley, the grain called sastika, and purified food. Milk, ghee, brown sugar, butter, sugar candy, honey, dried ginger, the vegetable called pataloka, the five pot herbs, green gram and pure water. Wheat, rice, barley, the grain called sashtika, purified food. The most nutrient Nutritious foods are foods, of course, that contain all elements essential for life, to sustain life. Seeds, roots, beets. Those groups of food contain all the elements of life amino acids, proteins, but also vitamins and minerals. They are complete to sustain life. That is why they are staple foods. Potatoes, rice, corn, um, wheat. We process them. So we have white flour, we have white rice, and we undo those precious foods of their most important nutrients. So, Try to eat brown rice, whole rice. Try to eat whole wheat bread. It's full of very important nutrients. So that is the part of the plant that is the important part. The green leaves are only conductors of energy and passing it on to the seeds, the beets, and the roots. So potatoes, carrots, in all its forms, the beets, all the seeds, those are the foods that are important. And they're sattvic, most of them. Onions are not. The most beets and, and, and uh, in Korea, onion is yang pa. But I, I thought that yang pa, yang, is indicating that it's a young food, and somebody explained to me that is not what it means. But it's a coincidence anyway. Are you saying beets or beans? Beets. Yeah, be a, a bean is a seed. Oh, yes. It, it falls under the, under the category of seeds. So beans, beets. A be beans is a staple food also. What do you like onions and garlic? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I put onions and garlic in my food. Um, I cannot eat only grass like they do in the temples. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but just just for your information. So anything in moderation is okay, right? Yes. Same with wine. You like wine? Drink wine. But if you eat too much, you crash. If you drink too much, you crash too. 
But scientists also know that wine is, is very beneficial for heart, for cholesterol, for, but you have to <laughs> don't drink the whole bottle. Beer. You like beer? Try to find a traditional beer. Not Heineken or Budweiser or OB. Does OB still exist? <laughs> Height? <laughs> because this is the, the, the traditional beer is very nutritious. It's made from, from grains. Barley, right? Yeah, or barley, hops, wheat, etc. But you know, modern beer, I have a feeling that the, 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 the commercial beer, Heineken, is just water with yellow and alcohol. It looks like beer, it forms like beer, but it doesn't have all the nutrients that traditional beer has. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. No, you like beer, enjoy it, but take a good beer. You like food, enjoy it. Good food, everything in moderation, like uh, Harini said. Life should not be punishment. And food, if you if you if you enjoy food in the proper way, is actually spiritual in itself. The purpose of enjoyment is to elevate your spirit. Alcohol is called spirits for a reason. But again, if you drink too much of it, you go the opposite direction. You go to hell. Now, milk, ghee, brown sugar, butter, sugar candy, honey. Wow. <laughs> Is that yogi food? These are, the, these are the energy drinks or the energy foods of the ancient people. Ancient people didn't have Red Bull or you know the the, the 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 energy bars that we can buy at the supermarket honey milk that was rare it was very difficult to get by it was a luxury to have those foods and yogis once things have settled down avoid these kinds of foods and you know sugar brown sugar honey they're mentioning all these things that these days are considered poison. Why? Because we get way too much of it. But ancient people got too little of it. They, it was rare, it was expensive, it was impossible to get. But because you need some extra nutrients, because you turn things upside down, these are the foods to go. The, the power foods, the energy drinks of the past. Sixty-three, the yogin should take nourishing and sweet food mixed with ghee and milk. It should nourish the datus and be pleasing and suitable. Nourish the datus means it should be nutritious. The datus are the seven building blocks of the, the whole body and everything inside it. The seven datus, the datu, the seven trunks of the elephant that represent Plasma, blood, muscle tissue, fat tissue, nerve tissue, brain tissue, etc. 64. Any person who is not lethargic in the pursuit of different forms of yoga attains perfection through practice. Be he young, old, or even very old, sickly, or weak. Now, this is good news. Everybody can practice yoga. Sometimes I get a phone call, somebody asking me about our yoga course, and then the question comes. I'm very stiff, I'm not in a good condition. Is it fit for me? My answer then is yes, <laughs> especially. If you're already very flexible and strong and healthy, you might less need yoga than somebody who is weak and stiff and, and unhealthy. Sounds a little stupid to say, but the unhealthier you are, the more you benefit from your yoga. 
I also, in the beginning when yoga started becoming popular in Korea, there were yoga courses, teacher training courses, where the part of the conditions you should, uh, how, how do you say this in English? Con let me say it very simple. The condition to join the course has to be, you must be young and beautiful. No lie. You want to join this course, you have to be young and beautiful. In the beginning, you know how yoga was made popular in Korea? Diet yoga. Every street corner you saw signs, diet yoga. Marketing wise, very clever. The people's most important concern is their appearance. If you want to have many students in your yoga studio, appeal to their appearance. Call it diet yoga, and it worked very successfully. <laughs> yoga is fit for everybody. If you are a yoga teacher, have a heart for your students. Understand their limitations. Do not demand perfection because you are offering health and healing to your students. Not physical perfection, a perfect pose or a pretzel pose. You have old people in your class, help them with, I'm not in favor of using tools, blocks and what have you because it diminishes the power of the asana. But be flexible with people who actually need it. Let people use the blocks and what have you so that they can do yoga too. You have to adapt it to their condition and ability. Yoga is truly healing, strengthening, physically and mentally. That should be your focus as a teacher. Not perfection of a pose. Don't push or pull your students when they are doing an asana because you want them to, be, to do it more perfectly. Because people get hurt. The Sutra is saying, if you're not lethargic, means that you actively engage in your yoga practice, you will reach Siddhi. You will reach the highest development that yoga can offer, opening up of the crown chakra. They call it Siddhi here, or perfection, but not the kind of perfection that comes with attention. When they talk about perfection, it is the, the, the higher level of development that yoga leads to. 65 continues to elaborate on that. One who is intent on practice will obtain Siddhi, but not one who is idle. Yoga Siddhi is not obtained by a mere reading of the scriptures. Many yoga books are written by scholars. Scholars who can translate Sanskrit texts, for example. But they have no or very little yoga experience. And yet they write about something so deep, so profound, which you will only understand if you go through that development yourself. Have you tried reading yoga books, serious yoga books? I've tried and thrown them away. They just give me a headache. After reading two, three pages, I think, what, what am I reading? I go back to the first page and I try again. And after two, three times trying and getting a headache, I just give up. It doesn't connect, it doesn't. This is academic language and, and very complex and complicated while the the original meaning of the text they try to explain, interpret, is very practical. If only they would have experienced it themselves. If only they would have lived it themselves. So the mere reading of the books doesn't make you a yogi. You have to engage. You have to practice, practice, practice. 
The next sutra I like even more. Siddhi is not achieved by wearing the dress of a yogi or by talking about it. Practice alone is the cause of success. This is the truth, without a doubt. This always reminds me of the day that we went to an island in the northern province of the Netherlands for a yoga retreat. We stayed there for three days and we went into the dunes, small island, we went to the coast, into the dunes and Ajita wasn't there yet, or he, he told somebody, you, you do the class, you take over the class. We were practicing out in nature. And there was this lady with a turban around her head and a curtain draped around her shoulders, all white, looking very impressive as a yogi with such a big ego. <laughs> and it was such a funny class. The alignment was totally off, and she was so consumed with her appearance as a yogi that is what this sutra is about. Just be yourself. Don't pretend. Don't, don't fool people into thinking that you are special or something. Just keep yourself busy with the contents, what it's really about. The last sutra, the asanas, the different kubakas, and the excellent karanas are all in the course of hatha yoga to be practiced till the fruit of Raja Yoga is obtained. Strange sentence. But it shows that the concept of Raja Yoga is very dynamic. Raja Yoga here means that you have reached the level where you become a natural scientist. Contemplation leads to you becoming a natural scientist. You practice yoga in order to develop that characteristic, to become a contemplative, meditative being. And when you understand that, you see that yoga is laying the foundation. So in ancient times, Having laid the foundation with yoga, reached the level of natural scientist, a contemplator, you then specialize yourself in a certain field. Ayurveda is the medical branch of yoga. So you specialize in Ayurveda, or you specialize in uh, astrology, horoscope, the understanding people's karma, on a very deep level, there were such certain specialization, but you need first to develop to the level of Raja Yoga until you start becoming a natural scientist. All science from the past was based, was, was produced by people contemplating. Before our modern technology, sophisticated technique. Ancient science was based on sheer contemplation. To the point, there are references in this book about molecules, about atoms. Atoms are invisible, and yet ancient people without, without uh, microscopes they, they, in their imagination, they just figured out that, that the structure of, of matter. And they came to the conclusion it's molecules, anu in Sanskrit. They had some pretty good idea of the universe. Without rockets, without telescopes, opposite of a microscope, just by looking at the stars and contemplating on what is out there. That is a natural scientist. You become a natural scientist. You will see that whatever it is that you do as a profession, you will become a specialist in that field, naturally. 
not because of all the books that you read, not because of all the, the diplomas, degrees that you have, but because you become a Raja Yogi. You become a contemplative being, which leads to you fusing with whatever it is that you focus on. You become one. Can you see that? I became one with yoga. I also became one with my dogs. Can you see that? Whatever it is that you do, you will put heart into it, you will become one with it. Because you become contemplative, you grasp the essence of whatever it is that you are looking at, including a human being, that is where originally psychology comes from. Animals, plants, or gross matter, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you acquire by study, you bring it to a whole other level, simply by this development. <coughs> Good. That concludes the Hatha Yoga Pratipika for the time being for this course. If there's ever an advanced course, uh, we will have we will have some pranayamas from this book later on. Two weeks from now, we will start with new pranayamas. In the advanced course, if there is going to be one in the future, chapter 3 and 4 will also be fully studied. Okay, let's have a short break.